All right, welcome back to Mac 1350. And we're rolling right along here. Uh, we're going to go through uh, Chapter 14 in our FANUC manuals. All right, we got one lot lab to do uh, at the end of this one. And it's going to be based on us uh, programming to the uh, the IOs. Uh, it's going to be a couple different on kind of each robot. So when we get into the lab situation, I'll kind of talk to each one of you guys about the specific robot you're on. And now we're going to program to that. Okay. So after this, we should gain kind of a general understanding about uh, using I.O. signals, uh, different types of hardware that kind of go inside the control cabinet, how we can monitor our, our controller I.O. And, and set up and apply. Okay, so inputs and outputs. Guys, a lot of this should be, you know, some a common thing that we've done uh, with the electrical class, with the digital electronics that most of you guys took. All right, so and where all these come from. So electrical signals, right? Those are what are going to enable the controller to communicate with uh, multiple different things. So the robot, the end of our tooling, different sensors, actuators, any other equipment. All right. Our uh, I.O. can be hardware signals or applications, specific functions. Uh, so, you know, just different things. So like on the big robot, we have some limit switches. Uh, we also have the area scanner. We have the interlocks on the gates. Uh, same with the carts, right? We have interlocks on the gates. You know, different things like that. I'm going to hook up uh, the Station 5 to each robot so that you guys can interface with the digital I.O. on the two remote robots, okay? So with that, we have, you know, how do you distinguish between things? So DI, digital input, one, okay, that goes with input one. Group output, two is group output number two. That's kind of how we define this. Uh, DI's, DO's, GI's, GO's, AI's. There's a whole bunch of different acronyms that we can go through uh, for all the signals. They're all kind of right here. So when we start talking about things, we're going to talk about uh, the user operator panel, I.O. Remember, I.O. stands for inputs and outputs. Uh, so U.I. and U.O. is user input, user output. We have our standard operating panel, so S.I., S.O., um, standard input, standard output, obviously, so on and so forth. Uh, you can take a look here. We have robot I.O., so R.I., R.O., DIDOs, digital input output group, input output, GIGO, and then analog is AI, AO. Okay, it's so fairly common sense. A lot of stuff that we've dealt with in some of the other classes. Uh, just doing control signals. We've done a lot of it with uh, Adreno controls in class. So you guys are using that, you know, to write for your robot programs as well. So we have uh, the user operator panel, the UOP. All right. So on those, there are 18 inputs and 20 or 24 outputs. Uh, four are optional, okay, so that's why it can vary anywhere between 20 uh, and 24. So uh, we can connect a remote device, so our PLC. So we use something like that uh, when we're, we use the two 870 Trainer Station 5 hookups to uh, operate the robot programs uh, that I have you guys call out. Okay, so uh, most of the signals are active when the robot's in a remote condition, and we always have all the safeties. Uh, in effect there. So still sticking with user operator panel. All right, they're configured by default to dedicated ports. Okay, if you configure the uh, user operator panel I.O., the physical locations are actually the digital inputs on the physical input and output. Okay, so when you open up the panel and on the card, they are literally the ones that are right there. Okay, uh, standard operator panel. All right, you cannot change the I.O. assignments. They are what they are. Okay, on the user one, you can change it around, but this one's kind of defaults and built in. This is what you get, and this is what you have to uh, wire up to if you choose to, okay? Robot I.O., that's all the uh, input and output singles between the robot and the controller. All right, so maybe there's some feedback going on. Maybe, you know, there's a camera on the end of it or what the tool is doing or those sort of things, okay? All those, uh, the robot inputs and outputs depend on the robot model, okay? Where do they come from? They come from the end effector, which we call the EE. Okay, and that's located on the robot. The standard setup for most robots is eight inputs and eight outputs for a total of 16 points on the robot. All right, and they're 24 volt controls. All right, and they're marked with EE, so they know that they're going through the end effector on the robot itself. All right, so we can, can send the control signal to or from the controller, and we're gonna look at the digital IO, uh, even on our large robot, we can uh, manipulate the I.O. and you'll be able to see manually turn things on, off. That's how the grippers are tied on the large robot uh, is to the I.O. versus using a Mac 
uh, macro on the, the other smaller robots on the teach pendant. Okay, so it provides access to data on a single input or output line, and we can do them in pairs. Uh, we can configure the digital I/O signals, you know, with polarity, so we can have them as active on or active offs in that case. The uh, R30IB make controller, we have 28 digital inputs and 24 outputs with our, that's what comes standard. So if you can take a look at the ranges here, when we look at the digital I.O., this is what a screenshot would look like on your teach pendant, okay? And, and it shows where they're located and what their numbers are, okay? The M1A robot has six inputs, all right, and six outputs. The LR200, okay, that's what we have on the little robots, on the smaller ones. That we have optional configurations there through the end of, our to end of arm tooling and the end effective connector, all right? So we have six IOs uh, that we can have. The M1IA and LR200ID, okay, they have optional solenoid valves, so we can configure the end of arm tooling a little bit for, as well. Okay, we have group IOs, so that's a sequence of digital input and output signals uh, that we interpret those as binary numbers. So if you remember back to digital electronics, all right, ones and zeros, or we did a lot of things, you know, where you went zero one or zero 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 one one zero one one, or you know, we went up to uh, zero 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 through one one one, or zero 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 up to one 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 one, right, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we had those strings of binary numbers. All right, so each bit in the group is a single digital input or output with unused bits assigned zero, okay? So we'll take a look at a little bit of that here in a little bit. Uh, analog signals, all right, input or output voltage that has a value, all right, the range of the I.O. board or the module. So that's remember how we use analog signals. Uh, they convert external analog signals into numeric signals for use, okay? So... It's kind of like using a thermistor or something like that, or not, not necessarily a thermistor, but we're using the signal voltage uh, to do our controls, all right? So the values can vary from negative 10 to 0 or 0 to 10. So like 8.75 might mean something or 6.25. Remember, analog's more precise. Uh, it's not necessarily an on or an off. So for teach, pending programs, analog data is converted into digits and then read, read to the program as numbers, okay? This is very similar to the PLC class so when we talk about stuff. We have modular IO, modular inputs and outputs. Modular means that we can add to them, okay? So we can keep adding modules to grow. So they are discrete IO modules and they communicate with the CPU through the interface uh, module and it does require a backplane in the controller so that we can attach and connect everything. All right, and digital inputs and outputs, we can come in 8 to 16 or 32, and we can also have analog inputs and outputs, okay? So if we have the Model B, so if we look in our controllers, ours look like this, all right, but Model Bs, same kind of concept. They're digital only, so they're 24-volt DC, or we use 120-volt AC as well, all right, no backplane required. We don't have any of these, though. Ours all look like this. All right, so different I.O. hardware options. Okay, a lot to go through. Um, what, what does this mean? What are they? So robot inputs and outputs, process inputs and outputs, the modular we just talked about, A and B, and then device net, control net, profi bus. So device net, that, that's something that Alan Bradley's proprietary uh, equipment that can be put into their uh, profi bus. That's what Siemens uses. So it's different ways of communicating with PLCs and control systems through proprietary equipment, okay? So different companies have different ways to interface with FANUC robots, essentially. So think about, you know, um, Apple versus Windows or Android or those sort of things and how those, you know, they can still kind of do the same tasks, but you've got to go with their equipment sort of thing. Same kind of concept. All right, uh, Ethernet IP. So we do that because uh, we have a vision system and we want to be able to hook up to the camera uh, and that sort of thing through the controller. Then there's how they assign the racks, okay? So it's the first part of the address for an I.O. signal. We're gonna get more in depth in this in the PLC class uh, when we start talking about this sort of uh, piece of things. Uh, so where it is physically on the module and where it's mounted on the rack, 
all right? And there's different rules, okay? So module A or module B starts at rack one, and then racks are numbered sequentially. So the specific racks go to specific proprietary equipment. So device net, Allen Bradley stuff, gets racks 81 through 84. Ethernet gets rack 89. Profibus, which is Siemens, gets rack 66 and 67. This is just where we tie everything into in the I.O. addresses. So like the main controller uses rack 48. All right, the slot assignment, that's the second part of the I.O. address. And we'll get into the addressing in a few minutes here. But the slot number distinguishes the individual I.O.s on the rack. And it lets you know where the space is. Okay, so slot numbers are going to be numbers 1 through 10, no letters. Okay, they're assigned sequentially. All right, and the first process I.O. board is always assigned in slot 1, and you cannot use them twice in the same rack. Okay, starting point channel assignment, starting point digital signals. The physical position on the I.O. module process board identifies the first port in the range. So it's the first one to plug into, uh, kind of the same kind of concept with the analog piece. So physically looking at the, the racks, okay? So we can see the interface module, right? That's where the inputs and outputs are all coming in, all right? And then the different slots to all the I.O. and control system there, okay? So, and then the open slot card, since this is modular, that's where we could add an additional one of those cards that you see. All right, and here's what the analog piece looks like on the inside if we were to take a look at it, okay? So this is where all the addresses are assigned. All right, and like I said, we're going to cover this more in the uh, in the PLC class about assigning this because it does. You know, this is how Fanix uh, assigns everything internally, but Siemens assigns stuff differently. Their PLCs, all right, and everybody's got their own kind of nomenclature that they go with uh, for all the logic assignments and things like that. So you can take a look here though where the digital input and digital outputs are on the rack. So if we look at the opened up rack here in the upper right hand side, okay, we can see where the digital inputs one through eight are located and where the digital outputs one through eight are located, okay, with the panel open and you can see where all the wires actually terminate there. So that's the address point for each one of those in the control, okay? So when we're talking about group input and output, we still have to remember how to read binary numbers. All right, so if we get something that looks like this, all right, five, four, three, two, one, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to us, but that's an indicator of our binary number. So that binary number is really one, zero, 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 one. Okay, so if we take a look at those different things, and if we remember back to digital electronics, those are our binary bits, right? Two to the zero, two to the first, two squared, two cubed, two to the fourth, right? So remember two to the zero is one, two uh, to the first is two, two squared is four, two cubed is eight, okay? Two to the fourth is 16. So we're talking 16 bits here. So for us, you need to remember how we get to the number 16. Well, if you remember that in binary, one, 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 one is 15, all right? To get to 16, we have to add that other digit. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's a 1 with four zeros after it. All right? That's the number 16. But that's not what's lit up here. This is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So we should know that that's the number 17. So the group output here on 1 is 17, looking at the binary bits. Okay, so that's really what this is about and how important that is. This will probably be a test question too, so make sure that you understand how to read that and where it comes from, okay? So where do we read all those from? This is, this is nothing new to you guys. We've done all this in digital electronics, all right? And we just read the number 10001, which got a 16. So we can see on here what I talked about before, 1111 is the number 15. So if you remember from digital electronics, we went from zero to 15, which is 16 uh, digits as we are doing count. Okay, so anything in green with a one is on, anything in zero is off. So there's how we produce all the binary numbers associated with everything. All right, group inputs and outputs. There are a sequence of digital IO signals, digital inputs and outputs. So it, it interprets those binary numbers, okay? And as it comes through, it also tells us 
the rack, slot, starting point, number of points, all of those different things are associated in the address. Okay, and you can't skip between points. So if we were looking at it on our screen, okay, and we look, we monitor digital inputs and outputs, notice you can go down, and you'll see this on the teach pendant, uh, if the status is on or off. Okay, simulated or unsimulated. This is a digital output, and then you can come over and you can force it. You can force the I.O. on or force the I.O. off. And this is how we do the, the tool handling, um, opening and closing the grippers on the large robot that we have. So this is very, very important though. Um, and you can't emphasize this more, especially those of you guys on the big robot. That they are for testing only. Don't simulate any of your I.O. while the robot is functioning. Okay, they're in test mode only and teach mode only. Uh, don't force any of the outputs. All right, we use them mainly for testing and troubleshooting. That's the only reason we're really forcing I.O. Don't ever do that when you're in the cage, okay? Even on the large robot, if you force the I.O., you're accidentally gonna drop the, uh, the end of arm tooling or the grippers and that sort of thing. When you're done testing your I.O., you need to make sure that you turn all the I.O. signals back to their normal condition because if you leave one open or closed and then you run the program it could cause some damage something might fall out um, you, just different things can happen it just depends on what IO you were simulating so always make sure that you put them back to the normal condition okay but you can force an IO you can force something to be on or off that helps us troubleshoot you know whether a sensor is out or, or a switch is gone or things like that because if we can force the IO and it still works that means the program piece is fine something else is going on in the system and we can go back and check it out all right so we want to make sure that we can simulate uh, the io so they have to be simulated before they can be forced on and off so you can see the s there okay so showing that it was simulated <sighs> simulating the io allows us to actually change that bit for the signal well, it's going into or out of the controller, okay? We're, we're forcing whether we want something to be on or off or to be a certain signal, a zero or a one or a true or a false, okay? When signals are simulated and no switching of the I.O. can occur, so signals need to be unsimulated before normal operation takes place. So just remember that we are not going to be doing a bunch of simulating I.O. in class. Now remember, that's just mainly for testing and troubleshooting and those sort of things or your initial run through certain programs. We won't be doing a whole bunch of that, okay? So don't worry about, you know, that too much. But uh, you need to make sure, though, you know, if this is something you do later on in life and you're sitting behind, you know, you're setting up the controls for something, you need to make sure that you have a list of all the inputs and outputs. Make sure you know the source and destinations. Understand the electrical characteristics. Okay, all the different protocols, timing diagrams, what the signal names are, so on and so forth. So that's going to wrap up the chapter for us. We're going to have a lab. Uh, where we're going to simulate the input and output, uh, but it's going to be one that I specifically give you with specific I.O. addresses. It's not necessarily going to be the one directly out of the book because it has to relate to our equipment. Uh, the one that's in the manual really works strictly for uh, when you're at a FANUC training center and you're using FANUC. Uh, or whatever they have set up, uh, I.O. simulation and things like that. So uh, for us, I'm going to give you a specific set of I.O. Uh, that we're going to simulate through and, and work out. And it's going to kind of vary per the different type of robot setups that we have as well. So uh, once again, any questions you have, please ask them in class. Else uh, we'll have uh, different uh, videos you need to watch for the lab or we'll be working through the lab. Getting close to the end here. All right, guys, we'll talk to you soon.